сан байцхан хүн төзөгчтэй өнөөдөр манай орооны нэвтрүүлгээр а чинг сайн тухай гайхамшигтай ном бичсэн Jack Weatherford оролцож байна. Jack Weatherford антробиологч зохиолч Jack Weatherford 25 хил дээр зохиол төрөвчээ. Тэрээр 1946 онд өмнөд Каролина мож төрж 1967 онд өмнөд Каролина гэн сургуулийг улс төр судлаач мэрэгжлээр төгссөн юм. Мөн 1977 онд Сан Диего дахь Калифорник сургуулийг антробиологч мэрэгжлээр дүүргэжээ. Миннесота мужийн Сент Пол хот дахь Макалестер коллежид 30 жил багшилсан. Чингис хааны тухай бичсэн ном нь 2004 онд Нью-Йорк Таймс сонины бестселлер болж байлаа. 2007 онд ерөнхийлөгч энэ хоёр түүнийг Алтан гадаас одонгоор шагнасан бол 2010 онд ерөнхийлөгч элбэг дөрж түүнд Монголын найрамдал медаль олгосон байна. Тэрээр Харвард их сургууль үндэсний газар зүй нийгэмлэг зэрэг 100 гаруй их сургууль музей Крапрацад лекц уншиж байж байна. Good evening Jack. Good evening to you Mr. Charles. Welcome to my show. It's a pleasure to be with you and the viewers of De facto. Thank you. Uh, at the beginning of your book you said Mongolians should respect those scholars mm. who sacrifice or who did so much for our country what do you mean and whom do you mean well in the 20th century there were many great scholars in Mongolia also many artists and many poets and many musicians who tried to keep Mongolian culture alive during a very difficult time mm-hmm. uh, many of them suffered persecution but many of them lost their jobs and some of course lost their lives and i believe that all of my work is just a reflection of their work i did nothing new i just continued what they had been doing in the last century and i think that's very important whether we're looking at uh see the poets such as natsak dorch in the 20th century or we're looking at the great scholars of mongolia to remember their hard work in a very hard time uh jack you have been uh, studying tribal uh cultures traditions mm-hmm. prior coming to mongolia prior to coming to mongolia what kind of other nomads culture you had tribal culture you have been studying most of my work was on american indians you know i am not a mongolist i was not trained in mongolian studies uh-huh. And so I feel always like an outsider in some ways that I've come into an area not based on what I knew but based more on my heart. I followed my heart to Mongolia because even as a student I wanted to come to Mongolia. I wrote to Mongolia, but of course it was a time when the United States and the socialist countries were in a cold war. We had very little cooperation and therefore it was not possible. When was your first contact with that time Mongol? My first uh, contact with the Mongols really was through the work of Marco Polo when I was about 12 years old mm. and I was reading about him and then he inspired me to read a biography of Chinggis Khan. It was a biography really written for young children mm. or young people. But I was so excited by this this country where people lived in I said tents but a gear they lived in a gear and they had camels with two humps on them and they drank horse milk it was the most exciting place in the world to me and so as a young kid I felt connected to Mongolia and I had five Mongolian stamps in my collection which year was it uh, I I received the stamps about 1960 could have been 59 or 60. At that time you were a high school student or I would have been about 14 years old. That's 14. right. Where you were born by the way? I was born in South Carolina. Mm-hmm. It's a southern state, very poor state. Mm. Uh we were born I was born in the countryside. Mm. We were farming people, farming. Mm-hmm. And how many siblings? Uh there are seven of us, seven children. And all of our scientists also? Uh, no, no. No, we were just uh You know, we were a very simple family in my uh family. My father uh joined the army in World War II mm-hmm. and so he was a fighting soldier in the war mm-hmm. and then when he came home, uh-huh. my mother was uh, working in a gas station uh-huh. and the bus let him off at that gas station. So she was kind of the first girl he saw, I think. Uh-huh. So he married her and then life was very hard there. So my father uh went back in the army during the Korean War. Uh-huh. So he served in the war in uh, uh as a soldier then as a cook as he got older he mm-hmm. became a cook. 
So you are this, uh, you call it, baby boomer. Yes, I'm a baby boomer, boomer. At the beginning of the baby boom, yes. And when you, uh, your father came back from army, they started, they got married and got uh, buildings made on homes, right, of this generation? Yes. Yes, he started building a family and home. Unfortunately, he had no education, so it was very hard, and that's why he had to go back to the army again when the Korean War came. Mm -hmm. He returned to the army, so I grew up as a child of the army. So what was your co where was your college? Uh, also in South Carolina. And I, why you have decided to be anthropologist? It's a hard question to answer. I think the truth is I love traveling so much, even as a child, because my father was in the Army, we were able to travel. So we lived in different states in the United States, and then we lived in Germany uh -huh. at just at the, some terrible times, such uh -huh. as at the Hungarian Revolution. Yes, 68. Yes, throughout that era. Uh -huh. So living there in Germany, it opened my eyes to other people and other cultures. Ah, the systems. So I wanted to see the world, and I thought anthropology would let me see the world. And you did? Yes, I did. How it many worked. countries have you visited so far? You know, I think before I came to Mongolia, I had already been to more than 120 countries. There are 240 countries in the world about, and you, are, yes. you have visited already half of them. Uh, yes, that's true. <laughs> How many? How many languages do you speak? Well, it's primarily it's English, German, and Spanish, those three languages. And then, of course, enough Mongolian to get by, just to get something to eat and chat with people in the gear about the animals, but uh, just enough to get by. Uh, Oh, Mongolian Mashi Kitsu, but be Nastava and Nasta is Mashi Kitsu, but Mongolian Maskoi, right? Maskoi, right? So, which year was that first visit, real visit to the country? To, to Mong Mongolia? Uh, the first time to come into the country of Mongolia was in uh, 1998. I had already been to Buryatia in Siberia in 1990. So before coming to Mongolia, you were in Buryatia. Yes, yes. It was easier uh, to get in there at that time in 1990. Uh, what have you been doing there? Actually, I was very much interested in how Asia and Europe united in commerce. Uh -huh. So I was looking at the role of all kinds of people, uh -huh. Turkic people and Mongol people, and uh, also the tribes of uh, Siberia mm -hmm. in the role of uniting the two. Mostly I was interested in the Mongols, but I wasn't able to come to Mongolia at that time. Mm -hmm. So you came to Mongolia uh, how long and what was that time, first your visit, purpose? Yes. Uh, my purpose, I was really writing a book about the role of the Turkic tribes in uniting Asia and Europe in trade along the Silk Route. Uh -huh. And I thought, well, Mongolia was always my great love. Let me go there for just a part of mm -hmm. this research to see the homeland of the Turks. Mm -hmm. is what I first wanted to see in the Orhan River Valley. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to travel the whole Turkish world from Orhan all the way to Bosnia mm -hmm. uh, in uh, three months in order to see a little bit of each country, mm -hmm. Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and so on. But first I started in Mongolia, and then my heart stayed in Mongolia. Within 24 hours, I was really in love with Mongolia. I arrived very late at night. The flight was delayed, so the city was quite dark. And you know, in the 90s, Ulaanbaatar was quite oh. dark at oh. night. That was, yes. So I didn't see Ulaanbaatar, which is fortunate, because <laughs> then the, early the next morning we had to leave. So I had a few hours sleep, I left. I didn't see Ulaanbaatar, but within 24 hours, I was totally in love with Mongolia because of the countryside, the animals, the hills, the grass. Well, um, you have uh, certainly done something that uh, made this country very well known all around the world. You wrote this book, Chinggis Khan, uh, and the making of the modern world. And this is uh, your recent translation of the book into Mongolian. Um, and the, at that time, when I, was, uh, when I bought this book, many years ago, uh, and I was surprised with this uh, design. <laughs> and you have very eloquently explained this design. Please explain us again. Well, first, I wanted no picture of Chinggis Han on the cover because there was no picture of Chinggis Han. I only wanted a Mongol horseman. That's what I wanted. But the American publisher, which of course owns the right to the cover, they insisted upon this picture. 
And I thought we had agreed that they would not do it. But then when the book came out, it had to pick China anyway. Mm. They couldn't understand why it mattered. They said, well, it, it looks like Chinggis Han to us. I said, yes, but it doesn't look like that to a Mongolian. He was a Mongolian. This is a Persian Turkish picture. And I don't think it should be used. So uh, I lost that round. Fortunately, however, all the drawings inside I was able to control because I had control the inside. So they were all done by Mongolians, but very simple drawings. I wanted no elaborate pictures of Chinggis Han trying to pretend that I knew what he looked like. In the book, there is a very strong statement which says that Mongolia is the, is the state who connected West and East, their civilization. In that way, it was a bridge, something like this statement in this book. Yes. Why you would think so? Well, if you look at the history of the world, there were regional civilizations. We had uh, India, the Muslim world, Europe, uh, East Asia, and each one had a little bit of connection with the next one. But there was no direct connection across the continent all the way from Asia to Europe. Uh, when Chinggis Khan was born, we, so far as we know, no one had ever traveled the whole distance from Europe to Asia and back, or from East Asia to Europe and back. We have no record if they did. But from the time of Chinggis Khan, every year since then, Europe and Asia have been in direct contact every year. This was a great achievement. This was the uniting of different regional civilizations into one world system. You were also quoting about the principles that Chinggis Khan and his sons were using when they were dealing with the different races, different religion, and different strata of society, of the different culture, all the swaks. Um, then you said about this uh, uh, indifference in, in, in about the religion. Please uh, uh, yes. state on that, a little bit, reflect on that. Yes, the Mongol Empire was always open to people of all religions. From the time of Chinggis Khan, Chinggis Khan's own followers included uh, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, and of course, shamanists, the people who worship nature. All of these were included. Chinggis Khan himself had his own very deeply felt spirituality, but he didn't try to impose his spirituality on other people. He accepted them all. And throughout the Mongol Empire, there was a very important part, religious freedom. It was the first empire in the world that really had total religious freedom. No other empire had ever done it. So in this way, this is one of the small reasons I say Chinggis Khan was a, a person of the modern world. He's not a person of ancient history. He's a person of modern history to believe in religious freedom, also to believe in the principle of diplomatic immunity, that you should never harm, punish, and certainly never kill an ambassador or an envoy from another country. In the time of Chinggis Khan, it was done all the time. In fact, several hundred Mongol ambassadors were killed during the history of the Mongol Empire. Chinggis Khan never harmed any ambassador, and any time his ambassador was harmed, he would take revenge on the people and punish them for harming them. Like uh, taking over Baghdad. Uh, Baghdad was one example, but before that, of course, Khwarezm, uh, and uh, also then uh, the city of Kiev, for example, another example. Some of them are very tragic examples because of the the punishment inflicted on the people. But if the people received the, the Mongol ambassadors in peace, the people were never harmed. If they killed the ambassador, they would be greatly harmed. So it was the case with uh, uh, Kiev, Russia? Yes, that time. yes, there was a case with Kiev. There is a, a, a Russian scientist well known for Mongolians, Kumulyov, yes. who said that uh, Mongolians played, Mongolian, Mongolian Empire had played an important role in establishment of statehood in yes. Russia. Yes. What do you think about that? Oh, I certainly follow him completely on that point. Uh, he is a great st a scholar. He's a particular great scholar of Mongolian history. I don't agree with him 100% on every point, but on this point I agree. The Mongols really helped to create the modern nations of the world. If you think about the way they brought together the Russian people to create one Russian nation, it was the same in China. They brought together many different parts and they really created China, which is a, a, a statement that most scholars will not agree with. Even in Korea, the three different uh, kingdoms were pushed together 
under Mongol rule. So the Mongols did a great deal to help create the modern world. Even several hundred years later, when you see the formation of India under the Mongols, you have the same influence operating. They're creating modern nation states. The map today is very much a map that was created by the Mongols. What would be, you have studied certainly all characters, many characters, you have described them very uh, picturesquely here. What will be the driving stamina of Mongolian, not only kings, overall Mongolians at that time, you think? Should be certain philosophy, certain, certain how it, today we call it, motto, vision. Yes. No, this is uh, perhaps one of the most important questions for understanding the Mongolian people, uh, both in the past and today. And I have to be very, very careful in trying to answer because I am a foreigner. I, I, I'm not a Mongolian, despite my great love for this country. But I would, the answer I would give, not because I can prove the answer, but only because I believe it, is that there is a great spirit of freedom uh, in the nomadic culture of the steppes of the Eurasian continent, mostly among the Mongols, but also among other steppe herding people. This uh, feeling of freedom, they want to escape from powers that dominate over them. They don't want to be given orders. And I think part of it is in the nature of being a herder. The herder wakes up every day, steps out of the gear, and they have to decide, what do we do today? Where is the water today? Where did the rain come last week? Where will the grass be next week? They're constantly thinking. It's not the same as being a farmer, where you're on one piece of land and you keep putting the seeds back into the same soil over and over. No, the herder has to be constantly thinking about uh, animals that are going to come in, about other people coming through with their animals, about people trying to steal animals. The herder is engaging in an act of freedom every day. And it's very hard for them then to kneel down. So the before freedom forming. is the natural conditions of Mongolians to be prosperous and strong. And independent. Independent. Yes, that freedom. Exactly. Because that sense we have been not able to talk about our history for quite years years of communism, mm -hmm. communism a socialist time and suddenly it's like it was like a, a flower that needed water yes so yes. I was thirsty so finally they got that freedom and for the last 20 years probably we are speaking too much <laughs> what do you find well i don't know if they're speaking <laughs> too much but you know it, it is to me it's interesting even today I feel like you know, every Mongol is a Khan. Uh, nobody wants to be the follower. Uh, nobody wants to take orders. And so sometimes it's very difficult for Mongolians to cooperate with one another because of this great drive for freedom, which, when applied in the right way, is a great force of history. What is the right way would be? I the mean, right way to, to current contemporary yeah. Mongolians they want. To share I th this vision. think it's to recognize that freedom comes always with responsibility to other people. You always have the freedom. Chinggis Khan had the freedom to do anything he wanted to do. But Chinggis Khan was born in a gear and his life ended in a gear. He did not build a palace. He was the greatest conqueror in the history of the world. And in a way, he was the poorest man in the world. He made his people rich. He didn't make himself rich. That's very important. This is a kind of freedom. He had the freedom to help other people, the that's, freedom to serve other people. That's a fantastic message to our current rulers. That's I want to really go to everybody who is today in the power and who comes to the power. Because like uh, all great people, uh, like Mahatma Gandhi or Chinggis Khan, right? People who made their people rich, not themselves yes. rich. Um, you wrote also uh, about Har Sult, Tsarang Sult. Uh, tell us about Har Sult, when the warrior goes to the war, put outside of uh, Ger or dwellings wherever they stay. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that part. Yes, well, I think most uh, people who are watching this show are probably familiar with the Sult of Mongolian history and how it was made from the horse hair that um, a man owned in his own lifetime. And in this way, the sult begins to represent his whole life. And as he goes... Everybody had on sult. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And as he goes through his life, this uh, sult is always with him, planted, uh, usually in the earth 
outside the gear, not inside, but always outside because it's outside that it gathers the force of nature, that the wind blows through it and it gathers the strength. And it's also outside that it leads the person forward, leads him forward in his life. And uh, Chinggis Han, of course, had uh, the great salt that he used, the, the white ones and also the black ones, which uh, symbolized peace and war for different purposes. But they contained a part of his whole life with the horses from his whole empire, from all the people who followed him. It was a very important item in Mongolian history. Have you seen uh, the current traditions, ceremonies, yes. following the, the suits here yes. in the country? How do you find them within the spirit we have just talked? Mm -hmm. No, of course, I feel uh, emotionally uh, about it because it represents the history. It's not directly connected to Chinggis Han physically, but it's an idea that still carries the spirit of the state after 805 years. It's still alive in Mongolia. So in that regard, I, am, uh, a very, I feel a great deal of honor for the Sult because it represents this ancient history of Mongolia. For Mongolians, Sult, what are other attributes you think that with we are staying since that time? to your best observations? Well, I think uh, in addition to being this great freedom-loving nation, the Mongolians are also quite self-reliant. They're very hardworking. Mm -hmm. They will go out, they will do anything. I've seen uh, women out there wrestling with yaks before, trying to make them do what they were telling them to do. So the Mongolian people, they have a, a lack of fear. They go forward, they work hard and they will stay working day and night until the job is done. These are characteristics that have been around for thousands of years on the steppe tribes. And I think that it's going to help the Mongolian people in their future if they can sustain it in so city life. What you're saying is uh, another feature would be for ordinary Mongolians that uh, readiness to work hard. Yes. To complete whatever their mission is. Yes. Okay, um, that's a fantastic, good, uh, actual, I think, message to contemporary Mongolians. Have you been, you have been living in Mongolia for quite some time, years, some summers, etc. Tell us about that part. Well, I, I, of course, enjoy being in Mongolia very much. I am still an American, and my children and grandchildren live in uh, America, and my wife's mother is uh, still living. And so we divide the year and we try to spend four or five months at least each year in Mongolia and the other time uh, back home in South Carolina now to be with the rest of our family. Not only in Ulaanbaatar? Uh, today it's Ulaanbaatar. In the early years I never liked to stay in Ulaanbaatar. I'd arrive in Ulaanbaatar, spend the night, we would buy supplies, get things, go to the countryside. I love the countryside. Over time as we get older then of course it becomes more difficult sometimes and uh, for my wife it's a little difficult now because she's in a wheelchair. So I have met her. Yes, uh -huh. yes. So it's uh, more difficult for us to be in the countryside mm. but still uh, even in Ulaanbaatar sometimes I pretend that I can look over the mountains and I can see Mongolia out there and I pretend that I can smell the real Mongolia. Of course it's quite different in the city. But my heart is always in the countryside, and we find little ways to get there for a short period of time. Uh, how many children do you have? We have uh, two children and six grandchildren. Do they visit Mongolia? Y yes, my children have been here with, their, with my, my daughter and her husband, and my uh, son and his wife, and our oldest granddaughter has been here. And then uh, my youngest granddaughter was uh, conceived in Mongolia, although born in America. Okay. Do they share the concepts you have put in this book? You know, the children <laughs> never quite share with their parents. You know, they think, oh, why is he interested in all of this? Uh -huh. They tolerate me, and they're very happy that I'm happy, uh -huh. and they're happy that their mother is happy. But uh, they can't quite understand sometimes why I love the Mongolian food so much, and I love being in the countryside, and even if you have a mouth full of sand, and. Uh, in the Gobi, it's still beautiful to be in the Gobi, and they don't always share it a hundred percent. 
What's your uh, favorite Mongolian food? I like etsky a lot, etsky. but also arot. Arot. Yes, arot, but etsky is my favorite, Why? I think. Why? Because it carries the flavor of the region. You know, you can taste the different parts of Mongolia, and you learn the, the different flavors. And so it's the same with arot. It, it's available all over Mongolia, uh -huh. but it's never the same from one area to another. And even sometimes from one year to another, it's a little bit different, depending uh -huh. on the conditions. And so I feel like that's a part of uh, Mongolia. So even in the city, if I can have, uh, say, arot from Hoft and from Omenkoiv, then uh, I'm feeling a little part of those places, even if I'm not there at that time. So I do love the, the dairy products of Mongolia. Uh, in all areas, natural sites in Mongolia, what is the most appealing or inspiring place for you? No, no, I think that the most inspiring for me is probably just to be out on the steppe. It doesn't exactly matter where, and mm -hmm. sometimes a very grassy steppe, sometimes a dry steppe, but to be on the steppe, but somewhere in the distance to see some animals and at least one gear. I feel extremely happy in those moments. There are some places in Mongolia that are extremely beautiful, certainly the Boktahan Mountain, uh, the rivers of Mongolia. They are very beautiful places, but for me, being on the steppe, it's where I feel I can breathe the Mongolian air. I can breathe and I can see the army of Chinggis Khan coming. At any moment, they will be here. Wow. <laughs> Let's go back to history, uh, in particular at the time when uh, Genghis Khan and his uh, created empire was uh, prospering, booming, and suddenly, like uh, many empires, it went down. What was the major the point and reason where it went down? I think that the most important reason really was the spread of the plague around the world because it uh, destroyed large commercial populations and it broke down the commercial system that the Mongols had created. Mm -hmm. So I blame it more on the plague than any other factor. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, we have to admit that there were certain faults in the Mongol Empire. You can think about a diamond. A diamond has faults in it and if it's hit by something very hard, it will break along those lines. And that's how the Mongol Empire was that uh, it was a great commercial empire, but almost from the beginning, very early uh, after the passing of Chinggis Khan, there were too many rivalries within the Mongol royal family. And of course, it goes all the way back to the story of Alankoa telling her sons the importance of unity. Chinggis Khan tried very hard late in his life to teach his sons the importance of unity working together. He put them together and sent them out on certain assignments. He would lecture them. He would go over the battles with them. He would go over everything that they did. But for some reason, they never really worked together closely. Is it a greed, human nature? What happened? I think part of it goes back to this, uh, not just human nature, but particularly the nature of nomadic lifestyle and herding. This independence that's so good and so wonderful and such a good trait mm. also makes it difficult sometimes for them to cooperate. So when the sons had the greatest empire in the world, still, of mm. course, they didn't want to give it to the eldest son, Zuch, because there were certain disagreements about him. And then, of course, uh, uh, Tsagade had argued with Zuch, so they wouldn't go to him. And then Ogude was the one who inherited it, but actually it was already a somewhat fractured empire. Not broken, but it just had those little fractures. And then within another hundred years, it broke apart. Uh, son of Ogude, Kubilai Han, created or Yuan Dynasty, or Chinese call it this Yuan Dynasty. Uh, and, uh, and also it, 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 it came to the end. What was that reason with Ugude? Uh, with Kubilai Khan. Kubilai was son of Tolo. Tolo Khan. Grandson of Kubilai Khan. Yeah. Kubilai yeah. Khan, you know, he was a very great and uh, intelligent man. He is not a person with whom I feel as much uh, personal emotional connection as with some of the others 
Uh, I always, of course, I like Chinggis Han very much. I even like Bat Han. I like Mong Han. There are certain Hans I like a great deal. And with Hublai Han, I respect him very much. You must respect him for what he did. But I believe that his decisions to relocate the empire in the south and to reorganize the empire along foreign models was not the best decision for the Mongol Empire. Because immediately we began to see it falling apart. With the Russian part, the Chinese part, the Muslim part, they're falling away from one another almost immediately. Uh, some people say that a nation conquered on horseback cannot be ruled from horseback. But actually, I think that a nation conquered on horseback must be ruled from horseback. And of course, uh, Kublai Khan dismounted from the horse. Wow. Well, we have been dismounted from the horses for quite some time, and including today's uh, probably contemporary. Today you see you are part of our society. You see now what's going on and happening. How do you how do you conceive it? How do you see that what's going on today? Mongolia's first time uh, now in our recent history becoming a really economically independent. Mm -hmm. Now we are sort of uh, do or making of our life, our uh, uh, ourselves. Mm -hmm. The yet there is a pro and cons a lot. Mm -hmm. We use a lot now mining, want to create better and more of material things. How do you see all this changes today? Well, you know, in the last century, the greatest American scholar of Mongolia was Owen Lattimore. Yes. He was a very controversial figure in, in America, but he loved Mongolia very much. And he said when he came here in the 1960s, he said, by the year 2000, Mongolia will be the richest country in Asia. It's very easy to look at that statement and laugh about how wrong he was. But Owen Lattimore was a very intelligent man. He spoke very good Chinese. He spoke Mongolian. He knew Chinese culture. He knew, knew other Asian cultures. He knew Mong So I know that he knew something. And I think that his time was obviously wrong. It wasn't the year 2000. But he saw in Mongolia something that's different from the other Asian people and other people in the world. He saw in Mongolia this tremendous potential that the country has. And I still believe that Owen Lattimore was right. The year was wrong, perhaps, but the statement was right. Mongolia still has the opportunity and the potential to again be the greatest and most prosperous country in Asia, despite the fact that it is extremely small in population. And also, if, if we look at the time since the founding of the Mongolian Empire in the year 2006, of course, Mongolia completed 800 years as a nation. That means now Mongolia has started the ninth century. The ninth century. And maybe this is the century when all the good things can come about. I'm not going to predict that it will happen, but I'm saying there's a very good chance. This is the opportunity, perhaps for the first time since Genghis Khan, a real opportunity for Mongolia to find a new place in the world. It's not going to conquer the world on horseback. It's not going to conquer it through any kind of uh, military means. But Mongolia is still a bridge. It still connects Asia and Europe. The Mongolian people have a great ability at one moment to be very Asian and in the next moment to be very European and to connect the two and to speak the different languages with great clarity and fluency. Mongolia is poised now at a great moment. It's not something that I will see in my own life completed. But for the children out there today, the children of Mongolia, they will be the ones to decide what happens to the nation of Chinggis Khan in the ninth century of the Mongol nation. What would be the basic character ethics, if we can say, for that Mongolians, our children, to have in mind for that? I think one important thing to remember is every child in every gear in Mongolia is the child of Chinggis Khan. When people talk about what did Chinggis Khan look like in the past, I say it wasn't important to him, it's not important to me. The face of Chinggis Khan is the face of his children today. You walk in the gear, that's the face of Chinggis Khan. The first boy, the first girl, that's the face of Chinggis Khan. And if we remember that every child is his child, then I think there's a, a certain fairness that I hope 
will prevail in this country. Because under the Mongol tradition, all the people own the land and the wealth of the land. The people own different animals, but they always would give animals to other people. They would take animals uh, to pasture in one place and give some of their animals to another. The Mongolians cooperated in the most important things. At the important times. At the important times. It worries me a little today when I see downtown Ulaanbaatar has changed so much in the last 15 years. Today you have everything in downtown Ulaanbaatar of any city in the world. The cable TV, the internet, I can have everything. Advertisement. But I look around me and nothing in the Gare district has changed in this time. Nothing. They still have no running water. For some people to have millions of dollars worth of gold out of the ground and for other children of Genghis Khan not to have running water I don't think Genghis Khan would approve of that if he were here today. I do agree. Completely agree. And I think in this ninth century, every Mongolian child will have running water, a place to shower, a light to work. And that's, I think, the mission of our generation, and we should do it. In spite of all things happening, I think that we should have a, enough wisdom and will to do it. Jack, now, <clears throat> thank you for the messages you have shared with us. Jack, whether for fund, tell us about the fund. This was actually organized by my friends, and uh, they put it together because they wanted to do something to help promote the study of Mongolian culture mm. and Mongolian history. Mm. And I must be honest and say I was very reluctant because I didn't feel that the name of a foreigner should be used for a fund in Mongolia that's going to be working on those things. However, in the end, uh, my friends kind of did it their own way anyway. But th the whole idea is to help promote the study of Mongolian culture mm -hmm. through uh, uh, publishing books related to Mongolian mm -hmm. history and culture, through sponsoring a prize that will be announced later uh, in the year uh, 2011 for books in uh, Mongolian history. and You have another book, Mongolian Queens. I do have another book, yes. I have the two books on Mongolia, uh -huh. Genghis Khan and the Queens. Queens. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Jack Weatherford Fund has ownership on these two books, publications, printing, or? Yes, the, the fund has uh, control of the printing and of the audio tapes also. Uh -huh. So all the money goes back all the money from all the books and all the languages go to Mongolia, all of it. Wow. And it will be used for? Uh, primarily for the promoting the education about Mongolian history and culture. I am very interested in the history, but also I love the Mongolian culture. When I hear the, wow. the music, you know, so modern... So proceeds Mongolian. of all your books in all languages will come to Mongolia for education of children? Already the money has come to Mongolia from all the uh, earlier books, but yes, all the money from all the works will go Do to Do you know in any statistics how much it is printed, in which languages, in how many countries? Uh, yes, it's in uh, more than 20 languages, but it's a couple languages were illegal, which I wasn't paid for, but that's okay. I'm not going to okay. argue about it. So it's about 25 languages uh -huh. all total. Uh, it's uh, sold in... Uh, in many different forms. It's in a printed form, in audio form, and also in electronic form uh -huh. in the English language, uh -huh. and then in some of the other languages. Mongolian is printed and also in audio form. This audio form got the international the uh, best audio book of the, of the year recently. For 2011, yes, that was the biggest surprise of my life uh, because uh, history books rarely win. It's usually <laughs> books that appeal to young people, often about adventures and vampires and things I don't even understand. But uh, many Mongolian people began to vote for the book, and the contest lasted for six weeks. And uh, the Mongolian people more and more voted every week. And in the end, uh, the Genghis Khan audio book did win. They did win as the best year, the year best book, audio book. Right. Yes, for 2011. Well, I was a part of this voters. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> and, um, well, so this book is not only uh, you made, you 
you famous worldwide uh, historian, and also a lot of money to the fund, which is uh, as you're requested for the education of Mongolia children, right? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much for doing that. Thank you, sir. And your very presence and yeah. the, the way you have introduced the great our ancestor not only to outside world, but the reintroducing to Mongolians in particular with this translation. Mm -hmm. I should thank you on contemporary Mongolians for this wonderful job, your heart. Uh, and I also, uh, I met your wife, wheelchair lady, and the way how you are treating your wife and dealing with the issues that can happen with anybody. And uh, this is marvelous. This is something like gives me, you do one of the person who walks you, you what you talk. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much for coming to this program. Well, thank you for having me here, but also, you know, you are one of the children of Chinggis Han. And so for me, it's a great honor to be in your country and to receive the hospitality that you and hundreds of other people have given to me. I feel that Mongolia has given the world so much, and sometimes I think the world has not given Mongolia very much in return. And so I appreciate the warmth with which I am received here very much. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.